Okay. Um, this is an interview within the um, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute um, Free City Radio Collaboration. Uh, we're trying to explore the ways that uh, Canadian foreign policy um, appears in one way in terms of particularly the Liberal Party's rhetoric, but in action um, actually has very severe consequences in terms of human rights around the world. Uh, you know, we've looked at a variety of issues, uh, including Canadian mining corporations in the Americas um, and uh, Canada's role in the coup in Haiti in 2004. Um, and our guest today actually has written quite a lot about that with um, Eve Angler from the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute about the coup in Haiti. Um, and I encourage people to check out the book between Anthony Fenton and uh, Eve Angler. Um, it's from a while ago, but I think remains very important. But today we're going to be speaking about uh, Canadian arms shipments and uh, specifically arms shipments to Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to getting into the details, but first I'll just want to say hi. Hello. <laughs> hey. Um, well, thanks for taking the time to join this conversation, uh, Anthony. Um, so you've been looking at this issue in some detail over the last few years uh, to sort of document the ways that um, the Canadian uh, government has allowed or even promoted in some ways the uh, distribution of uh, military grade equipment to the government of Saudi Arabia. So I guess first to start, could you just give a bit of an overview and start by explaining why you feel that this is an important issue to track and, and why you've been trying to do this work? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been uh, about seven years, I should say, so 2013, we started uh, not long after the, you know, we've just, we've just come upon the 10 year anniversary of the Arab Spring or Arab Revolutions, however you want it, or the beginning of the counter revolution, you could, you could put it as well. Um, but uh, it was around 2013, they were organizing a conference at York University while I was there on campus. Uh, on the Arab revolutions, and my friend and colleague Justin Panos uh, asked me if we he wanted to jointly uh, do a panel on Canada and the Middle East, and we said, okay, let's do a let's do a paper on Canada and uh, the the monarchies of the Gulf of the Arabian Peninsula, chiefly among them Saudi Arabia, um, and that's sort of how, how the ball got rolling on that. So he he and I wrote a couple of papers. Uh, we put like four person years into the research together and then he carried on in a totally different field, finishing up his uh, PhD research uh, at York. And then uh, I ended up just saying, okay, I'm gonna make, continue on with this and make this my, my dissertation topic. Um, and so that was before, that was before, for example, the, the big arms deal was announced in early 2014. So we'd already been looking pretty closely into it and seeing the dynamic of that Canada was in what was then we were calling a takeoff period in relations uh, with the, the Gulf wow. right? under uh, the Harper government. Wow. They're putting a lot of resources in. Of course, at the time, we didn't know that the, uh, the attempt to, to sign this, this deal uh, for the light armor vehicles began really um, uh, in 2012, according, okay. according to emails we would get through access and information later on. Um, and uh, so that was one of the impetus behind this, sure. this you know, resurgence of Canada's relationship. But, but at the same time, we, it was really hard to piece together what was going on historically to understand, to put this into a historical context. And so that's when we really began to try to unearth anything and everything we could are on the topic, right? And so eventually um, by 2016, I got my hands on uh, the treasure trove of, of Canadian archival records on uh, the relationship to really try and drill down and understand the historical mm -hmm. trajectory of well, the, the relationship in its totality, but in particular, you know, threads like, you know, the, the history of Canada's uh, arms, arms relationship, the relationship of selling arms essentially for um, access to other aspects of the Saudi economy, um, mm -hmm. arms for oil in a sense, you know, the, you see references in the archives to, you know, right, right at the beginning when say Canada's considering whether or not to sell what they call like class uh, two uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. They're like, well, we if we want any chance that the whole entire Saudi economy and, and the commercial prospects that that represents for Canadian capital, uh, well, we really have to change our, our arms export laws to allow for the shipment of these kinds of weapons. And um, 
so it was really eye-opening to go back and do that after this this arms deal in 2014 it had been announced so while at the same time sort of doing specific research into aspects of the deal that hadn't been really reported on uh, and then uh, hooking up with and trying to understand for example the supply chain and how sure how this kind of information in turn you know, you know really help me with my dissertation but also how it can help inform uh movements that might sure. want to uh look into disrupting the the flow of these weapons in the face of the intransigence and denial on the part of the federal government be it the harbor government the trudeau the trudeau government since then uh to consider canceling these uh export permits on grounds of principle of, yeah. on, not only that, but on grounds of stated principles that they they apparently adhere to you know that the accession of the uh, arms trade treaty uh, that yeah. did a couple of years ago uh, came into force over over a year ago now. I think you lose track of time in uh, in pandemic days, but um, the uh, the hypocrisy of say, claiming to adhere to certain principles of he, regarding human rights, etc., uh, and then on the other hand, continuing to ship these uh, weapons to them, right? And and not only to to continue to ship them, but to continue to sort of actively encourage the the stable of Canadian uh, arms dealing companies that exist under the umbrella of you know the Canadian Association for Defense Security Industries you know CADSI who hosts the annual arms bazaar in Ottawa every year can sec um, there's always been an attempt to help these companies diversify into markets other than the U.S. because if we sell us put all the eggs in the U.S. basket it makes it difficult for these companies to survive over long term yeah so they've always, they've always kind of set up institutions and gradually uh like through the canadian commercial corporation who actually are the, the agency the government that's brokering uh this deal with saudi arabia through the export development canada uh, extending sure. lines of credit and protecting canadian investors who want to uh, take the plunge into these uh middle eastern markets in particular so you know so for me it's just been trying to understand that trying to uh inform others and also along the way you know been an interactive journalist trying to help shape coverage in a way that's more critical um uh, to you know varying degrees of success a lot of, sure. lot of heads banging on walls and whatnot but um yeah so i do like i said it's been the, on the one side an archival research but also sort of day-to-day -to, -day to keep up with you know the latest you know the past 24 hours we come across a new deal uh with an undeclosed canadian company in burlington ontario to supply these uh high-tech cameras to put on attack helicopters for for uh, the kingdom of Bahrain, right? And of course, it's literally like the 10 year anniversary of when Bahrain crushed its uh, you know air air spring protests sure. in 2011, uh, where where Canadian armed vehicles were brought in yeah. uh, by Saudi Arabian uh, Royal Guard, um, which was denied by Canada, right? They never acknowledged that that was the case that that happened because the Saudis told them that they didn't, so they take them at their word, and that and that's been a pattern we've seen uh, repeat itself in recent years. So. Uh, there were instances where Saudi Arabia deployed uh, Canadian-made armed vehicles of a different variety in the eastern province against uh, a Shia population in a cleansing operation in 2017. And video footage caught, you know, captured these Canadian armed vehicles quite yeah. vividly. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you, 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 you actually addressed that in 2017. I remember the videos that you were sharing. Um, well, yeah. actually, you were resharing uh, videos from... Uh, people joining these protests for human rights uh, in Saudi Arabia um, that were facing military equipment that was linked to Canada. So just for people to try to understand uh, why, you know, you've described the tracking and the efforts and the research. And, and it's really interesting to hear you describe the ways that like working through an academic process and a research-based process was also like um a strategy to share facts with anti-war movements with human rights movements uh in terms of bringing attention to canadian arms exports to saudi arabia so um just on the level of like the on the ground situation you talked about the protests in saudi arabia of course, people are are following what's happening in in yemen right now and of course the saudi and Arabian government is deeply involved in uh, military action in Yemen uh, that has led to one of the worst humanitarian disasters in the world. So can you talk a bit about 
uh, the consequences on a human level of Canada agreeing to ship arms to Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I mean, in, in the case of Yemen in particular, you know, I mean, uh, this began almost six years ago, next month, uh, and it began under the, Har the, the waning days of the Harper administration, but also began crucially in the very early days of the bin Salman uh, era, right? So we have King Salman who acceded to the throne in January of 2015, yeah, uh, and if you remember, you, be, you, you picture the moment uh, when uh, the death of the previous king happened. Um, everyone, all the global elites were in Davos, Switzerland for the World Economic Forum um, at the time. And when he died, most of them just redirected their flights from home to, to Riyadh, where they had went to pay their respects. And John Barrett, the former Canadian foreign minister at the time, was, was among them. Um, yeah, but, and this is, uh, of course, paying respects to a, a dictator. Yeah, essentially, yeah. But I mean, this is the archival research really brings into relief just the, the, the relationship that Canada has tried to cultivate over the years is much deeper than yeah. we're led to understand. You know, where mm -hmm. is he Trudeau today um, well, distancing himself? He's gone out of his way to not make it appear as though he has any sort of warmth towards the, uh, the Saudi regime, right? That, that he's holding his nose and upholding the, the terms of a contract that he's bound to by the previous government. But yeah, that's what, he, that's what the liberals are saying. Yeah, well, the reality is like his father was the one who traveled to Saudi Arabia uh, um, with one of his brothers and um, basically laid the, the, the cornerstone for what would be the, the, the next 30 years of lab deals up to the present day. Um, and uh, in any case, getting back to your, your question, uh, when uh, the, the, the war in Yemen broke out, the conservative uh, government came on board on the side of the Saudi coalition. Right? This is a conflict, of course, that's been going on simmering. There's been various mini civil wars over the years. Oftentimes, uh, before the previous uh, Yemeni president Saleh was uh, overthrown through the forces of uh, revolutionary sort of sentiment and fervor that course through the region in 20, 2010, 2011, yeah. um, Saudis weren't happy uh, initially, but and they, but they wanted to manage the process. Yeah, so because there were mass protests going on in Yemen yeah. For, yeah. for democracy and, and social justice. So the agreement that Saudi Arabia signed off on at the time was like, our guy is going to be the transition president. And then whatever the process is, we're going to make sure that our guys are in power and then but then you had this counter counter force the, mm -hmm. the Houthis who said uh, <laughs> there's also a mass pro, you know, opposition to that process and nobody really saw that as legitimate but the Saudis signed off on it the UN signed off and countries like Canada signed off on it so that gave a sort of legitimacy to the invasion by Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners mainly the UAE and Egypt um, but also Bahrain, Qatar at the time, before they were then sort of booted sure, out. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, this was a military intervention in Yemen. Yeah, it was a full-scale yeah. um, military intervention in March 2015. And so Canada came on side and said, we support the restoration to restore the the puppet president, the Hadi, who's been living in Riyadh this whole time. Yeah, out of Yemen, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so... But at the same time, so that has kind of resulted in, okay, we'll we'll denounce you know Houthi crimes in 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 uh, Yemen, or we'll denounce all sides of the conflict, any violence, but we'll we'll, we'll not uh, single out Saudi Arabia, uh, we won't single out the UAE, because um, the relationships are too valuable, right? They're considered a close uh, partner, what they call some. Sometimes in the documents they refer to them as an ally. You know, political scientists don't like the misuse of the term ally for whatever reason, but. Um, but Saudi Arabia is considered a close partner in the region. And, and um, you know, this more or less was continued under Trudeau. Sure. Uh, except for the what happened in 2018. You know, they made, um, and then what was going on behind the scenes. There's all these other little side stories and Game of Thrones type dramas uh, that are going on, for example, with uh, the former uh, Minister of Interior, right? So Canada had a really tight relationship with the former Minister of Interior who was set to become second in line to the throne if Salman had died initially, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef. Um, but then he was taken out by MBS, the son of the king, right? And so Canada's number one champion inside the royal family was taken out. And then anyone who had a really good relationship with him now are like, okay, well, you got to go through 
MBS and King Salman. So, um, yeah, which they, and we're talking just to underline Anthony. Thank you for yeah. sharing all this. We're talking about a dictatorship and the procurement of Canadian weapons to this dictatorship, even with the government of Mohammed bin Salman, of course, who it's been seen globally now has been deeply involved in many actions that have undercut human rights on the most basic level. Yeah, so just, I know I'm taking a long approach to this, but- I, I, re I really appreciate it, thanks. Khashoggi was murdered in 2018. Um, nobody knew that there was uh, an attempt by Saudi Arabia to do the same thing to the right-hand man of the overthrown crown prince and Mohammed bin Nayef. His right-hand man, Dr. Saad al-Jabri, mm -hmm. is currently living in exile, self-imposed exile in Toronto. And he's been there since late 2017 and Saudi Arabia tried to lure him back. They tried to force him back by like basically kidnapping a couple of the, the, the kids that didn't get out of the kingdom. Um, they tried to get Interpol to issue a warrant and Interpol wouldn't do that. They tried to get Canada to basically intervene to extradite him. And they, that must have really pissed them off. Um, so all the while these things are going on. And then we learn from a, a court filing by Al Jabri last year that in the days after Khashoggi was assassinated in the consulate in Turkey, yeah. they, sent, they sent a similar, they're accused, Saudi Arabia's accused by Al Jabri of sending a similar tiger squad, death squad, essentially to Canada to get him. Uh, and not on not once, but uh, on two occasions. Um, wow. And then this is all going on, probably with the knowledge of like Trudeau and the Canadian intelligence community, um, the US and of course Saudi Arabia and all these uh, actors. Um, but then the diplomatic dust up happened in uh, August. Uh, sorry, sorry, the, the Interpol issues that happened in the previous, in the, in the run up to the diplomatic dispute between Canada and Saudi Arabia in August. And then it was only two months later uh, that they're still trying to kill this Al Jabri. And so Canada's got a real sort of dilemma on its hand now. Uh, under Trump, they got no help uh, with respect to trying to, you know, um, restore relations or what they call normalized relations with Saudi Arabia. But one of the first things, of course, that, that they said when uh, the diplomatic dispute happened was, well, don't worry, we're not going to cut off oil shipments to Canada. And Canada's like, well, don't worry, we're not going to cut off arms shipments to Saudi Arabia. Oh, In fact, wow. Canada, Canada took no retaliatory measures whatsoever. It was only Saudi Arabia sort of when, when um, Christia Freeland, uh, then Minister of Foreign Affairs, tweeted about the uh, human rights issue with uh, Raif Badawi's sister, said, well, we want, we want, we call on Saudi Arabia to, to let them out of prison. And uh, they took, they supposedly took a front, you know, to this, and that's what kicked off this freeze in relations. But when you step, take, take a step back and you sure. factor in this new information that we get after the fact, and it's like, okay, maybe it, we have more to do with this failed attempt to get Canada to extradite Al Jabri. And this carries on through the courts. Another filing happened this month. Um, but it, even at the same time, this same this week, you had this filing, or last week, uh, of the this uh, countersuit in Canadian courts. Because um, the Ontario court, on the basis of a Saudi suit filed in Ontario, froze Al Jabri's assets uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And another counter countersuit was filed. But then... Just the other day, two weeks ago, January 25th, I think you might have talked to the, uh, Rachel Small about this, about the, the protest uh, at the, the Canadian Trucking Company that delivers the labs down south. Well, just the other day, this, this week, at the port to which those trucks, uh, the labs are delivered, uh, there was a protest there in Portland at uh, Dundalk Marine Terminal. Um, because uh, throughout all of this, and, and whether or not these new labs have even appeared in Yemen, because to date, there, I've seen no evidence of it. Uh, we've seen the older model labs that Canada has been supplying for decades, but a big what nobody really talks about is a, is a big part of the the contract in the first place uh, was uh, devoted to the upgrade of those old labs, some of which we may very well have seen new and improved in in Yemen. Um, uh, there's other Canadian armed vehicle companies that are based in the Middle East, like uh, the Street Group. Um, they have a huge production facility there that's been pumping out hundreds of our vehicles for the Saudi Arabia's partners in Yemen. So they're the Yemeni uh, forces and whatnot, Sudanese forces that they brought in and wow. they, they basically mercenaries supplied with Canadian made armored vehicles. You know, um, we had these sniper rifle, uh, a huge uptick in sniper rifle sales from 2015 to 2018 uh, shipped to Saudi Arabia. You've seen photos of 
lots of like sort of selfie, Saudi selfie uh, with with their big Canadian made uh, sniper rifles. You've even seen accusations of them handing them over to Yemeni proxies and, uh, mm -hmm. and Canadian officials have rejected these allegations out of hand. You know, um, when I just wanted to, uh, Anthony, you mentioned uh, the type of vehicles and you're using the acronym um, mm -hmm. Just for people who are maybe not following this issue in detail, could you could you highlight the acronym? Uh, you mean the the labs, like the light yeah. armor? So yeah, that th there's the labs, which is the fourteen billion dollar contract between General Dynamics, Land Systems Canada, uh, and Saudi Arabia, brokered by the Canadian government. Yeah. Um, but then there's this other company called Street Group, Strike Group or Street Group. They're based out of uh, they have a huge facility in the UAE. And the UAE government actually owns a piece of that operation, and they've been supplying, you know, like I said, upwards of hundreds. I've seen, I think we've we've seen upwards of like eighty or ninety of them that have been destroyed in Yemen. Like that's, and you think about what that represents, the percentage of the the fleets sure. of them that they've sold. Um, so yeah, so Canada's uh, more deeply implicated in many ways. You know, Canada, the the government says, oh, there, that's our vehicle company in the UAE. That's the UAE's problem. Our export arms export laws don't apply to it. Um, and then um, at the same time, you see Canada, you know, say, look, we support the peace process in Yemen. We send yeah. tens, of million, tens of millions of dollars in aid to, to Yemen, um, et cetera. And what they've said repeatedly, one of the points I was trying to make earlier when I mentioned the, the 2017 uh, uh, incident was when the media reported on that, the Global Mail front page articles, uh, they did okay. We're gonna freeze. We're gonna freeze those export permits so while we can investigate, look into it closer because we're deeply concerned about this situation. Well, what they do is they let a few months go by. They conduct their little investigation by speaking, as we learned after the fact, to almost exclusively like U.S. sources, Saudi sources themselves, but not the the victims. You know, for example, and then conclude that no, they weren't used um, in any way to. Uh, violate human rights so therefore we can lift the moratorium and they can because they got they got a whole bunch that are they're waiting to ship uh, you know re-up the shipment and so they did that and then they did that again um following the assassination of Khashoggi now they had uh, there was a lot of pressure on world leaders to distance themselves from Saudi Arabia when that happened you know that brief moment um of clear of clarity and moral you know moral uh, principle that emerged you know for for a few moments amongst the world leaders uh they wouldn't go to the big uh, Davos in the desert meeting in, in Riyadh. Um, nobody wanted to be seen with MBS. The Hollywood agency cut ties with them, said, here's that $400 million you gave us back. Um, but that was a very temporary moment, you know. Um, and then they, so Canada did temporarily pause, not the shipment of labs, that, that never got paused. Uh, they paused new, the issuance of new export permits. Got it. Um, but then last year, they apparently renegotiated the terms of the contract with Saudi Arabia for the light armor vehicles uh, because they were like almost $3 billion behind on payments. And they, they kind of, the Canadian government floated a loan to General Dynamics at $650 million. Say, here, man, we're going to cover your costs because Saudi Arabia hasn't been paying you for the labs that you've been shipping there every month. And so, um, so, so just, just to be clear, uh, Anthony, what you're highlighting. Um, sort of the mechanics of arms exports to Saudi Arabia and all the different elements of the government that are involved. Um, this is a very um, clear and stark contrast from the rhetoric around Saudi Arabia that we hear from Justin Trudeau. Uh, you've mentioned this um, in our exchange so far and thank you for that. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could um, maybe look at sort of the question of the investigation of these issues or this idea that somehow maybe the government doesn't know the full extent of how these weapons are being used and sort of feign, um, you know, unawareness or feign ignorance about, you know, about this. And then, and, and, and also of course the important point, which is the fact that the Canadian government actually gives arms exports to companies to allow them to send these weapons abroad, in this case to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, the permits. I mean, yeah, that so that's been the process. It's like we we investigate. So the the the, the most recent arms you know, moratorium on uh, the shipments to Saudi Arabia, um, they concluded in in the note that they issue after the fact. They they issue okay. Say, well, look, people people keep saying 
one you should you should cancel the the, the contract because of the war in Yemen. But then they keep saying, well, look, we've seen no conclusive evidence that they've been used in Yemen. Therefore, we we should we can't cancel it on those grounds. Show they're like show us the evidence. Show us the incontrovertible evidence that a lab has been used to kill a Yemeni civilian. Like that's the bar they establish, right? When when you look at like Project Plowshares and, and the other organizations uh, mm. uh, are like, no, that, that's not supposed to be the criteria. It's, it's even the risk of their being used uh, or the risk of their being diverted to other forces. It's those, those are the criteria you should be using. But so it's like all this little sort of double play, this, this um, their, uh, what do you call it? Bureaucratic speak. You know, like they assume that like people, we're just not gonna, okay, we're, we're gonna hear them say that and be like, okay, and be content with that. But what, unfortunately, on the on the flip side of that, there's such a lack of investigative uh, journalist, you know, culture in Canada. Um, it's it's pathetic, really. Like, you know, just a, a minor example. Last week, when the Globe Mail did cover the protest at uh, the trucking company, they're like, "Well, campaigners believe that this trucking company is bringing the labs down to Baltimore," and it's like. That's an established fact. It's not. It's not a belief. It's it's a fact. But like the, the journalist Steve Chase of the Globe and Mail just hasn't bothered or doesn't have the time or resources to just go chase down just those little details. You know, another thing like it can't. It, the Globe and Mail's never reported on. Uh, for example, B Belgium. They they've taken the they pushed the envelope a lot further than say we we have in Canada in terms of the courts. So trying to get the permits revoked because because these labs uh, can't be shipped to Saudi Arabia without the cannons that are shipped to Montreal from Belgium um, and then installed in London and then shipped back to them. And then Belgium came like this close to actually canceling those permits. But in the end, the Belgian government said, well, look, those labs are going to the Saudi Royal Guard, not to the Saudi Arabian National Guard. Like nobody knew this. This is a fact that like wasn't disclosed in the, over the last six years. But then this Belgian court disclosed it. So like, the Global Mail has been reporting on for six years under the assumption that these are labs that are intended for the Saudi Arabian National Guard, who are heavily committed to the war with Yemen, mainly along the border and whatnot. Um, but in fact, these labs are ded dedicated to the protection of the Saudi royal family, which brings with it its own set of problems and its own set of questions that needs to be uh, raised but and I raise this you know with these journalists <laughs> nobody seems to care at this point it's like it's really bizarre so some this is weird how some of the basic facts of this whole deal just aren't aren't investigated there have been really good pieces here and there um and it's kind of at a standstill right now so you'll get these sort of one-off like the uh Al Haflul, the the UBC graduate who's just released from prison in Saudi Arabia after a thousand days wallowing there, uh, tortured, sexually assaulted, et cetera. Uh, she's been released and she's not allowed to go on the social media or leave the country, but she's been released under the pressure of the, the new Biden regime that came out and said, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna uh, pause, do their own moratorium. They're gonna do the Canadian thing. We're gonna put a moratorium on our sales to Saudi Arabia sure. for a while. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna remove support we've been giving to them for the off offensive operations in Yemen. Um, and then, so Saudi Arabia was like, okay, well, we got to at least give the appearance that we're, uh, you know, we're listening, you know, and let out a few prisoners. But so the interesting thing, though, one other point, though, is uh, another thing nobody reported on was very symbolic was, you see, the original terms of the contract for the light armor vehicles was signed in 2014 with the previous king and the previous, you know, royal, you know, under, under his auspices. When it was renegotiated last year, nobody said, oh, wow, so that means you own it now on the one side, the Canadian government renegotiating this new, the new terms, this new contract with the new regime. So this is like, and now it's a deal between MBS and Trudeau. And nobody really reported on the sort of the symbolism or the irony of that situation, but. Mm -hmm. um, well, on all that, Anthony, I mean, you've taken the time um, over years to track this, um, both political negotiation, but also um, the economic benefits of uh, Canadian corporations involved with the military industrial complex who are benefiting from this arms relationship between Saudi Arabia and the Canadian government, which as you've just underlined, has not really been curtailed in any meaningful way under the government of Justin Trudeau. Um, so on looking at 
all that you've laid out, Anthony, in the context of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, and you know, you mentioned uh, the recent protest in Hamilton and Toronto that uh, was attempting to highlight the very local nature of the production of uh, military equipment for uh, export to Saudi Arabia in Canada. Um, and the blocking of, of, in fact, trucks transporting this equipment uh, that did get attention, as you mentioned. So all of what you've mentioned, um, I guess the last thing I, I would ask you, if, if you could talk a little bit about um, the ways or any reflections you have, Anthony, about how all this information could actually uh, push or um, actually shift the way that uh, Canadian policy on arms exports to Saudi Arabia takes place because um, you know you've been connected with activism for a long time and and I do get the impression but you follow this much more closely than me that uh, with more information with more awareness that the liberal government probably would not be very comfortable about the fact for example that the export agreement for arms was just renegotiated with two heads of state Mohammed bin Salman. MBS in Saudi Arabia and Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's one of those one of those topics that's very very poorly understood. You know, there's a reason. Like, I, I think that like in in the course of research in this over like seven years, like only two attempts have been made previously to to write anything resembling like a history or even a current history of Canada's relationships with with uh, uh, the dictatorship essentially of the Middle East. You know. Um, so there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think that, yeah, once, uh, once people we begin to understand the, the true nature of these kind of types of relationships, um, like there's been some really good work, say the, the, the situation in Turkey, um, recently, the project plowshares issued a report on the use of Canadian technology on the drones that Turkey was using. And that's the same technology you find in Saudi Arabia, UAE, all over the Middle East. And of course strewn throughout the U, you know, U.S. military uh, industrial complex. Um, but the, it was actionable, like like those export permits for those devices got got uh, pulled. And that was one instance where they actually seemed like they actually took a principled position uh, by virtue, but it was an information and research-based effort that was required to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there's a danger though in relying on the media coverage of like if they're the filter through which the information that needs to reach people, uh, mm -hmm. that's that's a problem. You know, because we've seen that was you know there needs to be a much. They're not going to do it on their own. Basically, it's one thing we can conclude after yeah. like seven years of trying to draw attention just to this one deal, right? But um, it's a historic issue. You go back through the archives again, the media coverage going back 30, 40 years. Sure, see, sure. It comes in cycles. The same issues have been raised. Uh, activists have been going to this. These, these same companies and holding demonstrations. Um, mm -hmm. So there are much bigger issues here. We clearly, uh, taking a step back, need a, need a, a movement and then ultimately a, a left, you know, a government of some sort of the federal yeah. level, you know, uh, that would that would actually like reconsider bigger questions of like, why are, why are we linked up? So like, we're just like, we have a, uh, like an IV, you know, between shared IV between our, our military <laughs> industrial complex and the U.S. one, and then in turn, this reliance on on um, this the same kind of uh, deals that that we supply with the the Middle Eastern petro uh, yeah. because who doesn't want those that, that cash, right? If you, if you're gonna have a military uh, industry, you're gonna have to allow them to pursue these deals. That's and that's what they because once upon a time. Following, um, at least as recently as the mid '70s, Canada did not allow offensive uh, weaponry to be exported to what they used to call conflict states. Anyone, anyone peripheral to or involved with the Israel-Palestine conflict, right? Uh, and Saudi Arabia, in particular, was one. Was this, they, they kept rearing their heads because they clearly were trying to develop their military going back that far, even. And they would get offers to, to, to Canadian uh, suppliers. You know, we want, we want what you you make. And the Canadian officials are like, no, our hands are tied. We cannot ship to Saudi Arabia. We cannot approve those export permits. Whereas now, it's like, how do we get here? And then that's yeah, like, sure. how do we go back? You know, if we sure. got here, if we were there before, and we've gotten where we are now, how can we either go back there or just dismantle the whole thing? And you know, what I mean, it's like, 
these are bigger questions that we have to deal with, but not to understand the, the, the processes that gave rise to this is important for me. And hopefully, you know, people will read uh, my dissertation when it finally comes out in you know, a couple of years or whatever, and uh, we'll at least have on record, you know, uh, a clear sort of analysis and overview of this whole history that mm -hmm. helpful, hopefully. Yeah, but I just also want to underline Anthony, and uh, I think myself and many people have really appreciated the effort uh, to detail that you've um, worked on to communicate uh, a lot of the um, moves uh, to normalize this military relationship. And I, I also have seen it being picked up by some uh, mainstream media, but I, I really appreciate what you mentioned about these issues not really like not imagining really fundamental shifts on these issues unless there's social movements pressuring the government to to take them on so so thank you for highlighting that and and thank you so much for taking the time to speak today oh thanks for inviting me Seth. thank uh, you good, good to see you likewise